Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, welcome to Postscript. I'm Pastor Dan Slagle and I am with Lou Ann Riley who has preached the second installment of our sermon series that we're calling The Naked Truth. Today, Lou Ann, you preached about the gift of singleness yes. and how singleness uh, is uh, related to sex from a biblical perspective mm -hmm. and it's generated some very, very good questions. So let's right. just jump let's do right in. Uh, first person wants to know basically, is Christ truly enough? They write, uh, we sing that Christ is enough and say that He's all a person needs and yet insist that we must be in community and no one should take on the Christian walk alone, especially at Faith Bridge. Uh, regardless of having a romantic relationship in one's life, how do we honestly balance this tension? Well, I think this is a, a really good question because I can see where it could be confusing if you didn't understand. Um, so I think what we have to talk about here is the understanding of when you become a believer and mm -hmm. when you enter into community. So when you become a believer and you profess that Christ is enough for me and that I want to follow Him, you enter into the body of Christ. Right. He talks about, and we see all through the Bible, where we're all parts of mm -hmm. the body of Christ. We all belong. Right. And so the Christian walk or the Christian faith is not something that uh, we do in isolation. Mm -hmm. um, that yes, Christ is enough in terms of my life and I can trust in Him and I can place everything in Him, but with it brings community and people. And so they go together. Becoming a believer, you enter into community. Good. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. So the next person wants to know about, uh, are singles in some way missing out? I've always heard that a marriage relationship is the closest physical human representation of Christ's love for His church. Does that mean that those who are called to be single their whole lives are somehow robbed of getting to fully experience Christ's love for His church? Okay, so when we talk about this, it's kind of one of the things I talked about today, mm -hmm. um, the perception that we do promote marriage, um, and we often don't look at the gift of singleness. But if you look at what Paul's talking about, when he talks about marriage and when he talks about that experience of Christ in the church, he's using that as one of the ways that we experience yeah that, that the uh, marriage relationship is the closest human relationship. But like we said today, the gift of singleness doesn't mean that you can't experience the way that Christ loves the church. Um, you just experience it in a different way than a marriage person would. Right. So Paul's words ab about marriage are not the final word about mm -hmm. a relationship with Christ. Rather, they are the final word about marriage right. and a relationship with Christ. Exactly. Still plenty of room to talk about what it means to be single mm -hmm. and walk with Jesus. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from a concerned parent about uh, the tide of mm -hmm. culture. As a parent of grown kids, we have seen how the moral fiber of today is really difficult for our kids to navigate. Um, it's a tall order because some responsibility lies in the home, uh, at school, church, and so forth. What do you think about how we deliver change? Well, I believe that the, the way that we go about fighting against culture or this tide of culture is by equipping our children mm -hmm. to do that. Um, they, Christianity is very counterculture. It uh, opens up a lot of opportunities to talk to your kids about what culture believes, what you're hearing, what you're seeing versus what we believe and what you're hearing, what you're seeing. And I think first by modeling that, right. by being a light, by being different than culture, by showing your kids that your faith is real mm -hmm. in the way that you model that. Um, and then also having an open space or dialogue with your children where you can teach them what that means and sure. how they can be different than culture. Yeah, so it's it's a bit of an unrealistic expectation mm -hmm. that uh, our kids are going to change culture. Mm -hmm. they, they will be salt and light in the mm -hmm. midst of it, but culture is going to be what it's going to be. 
our job, if I hear you right, is simply to equip our kids to get ready for whatever culture throws in. Yeah, and I think just like I told in my story today that when I showed up to college, I felt very naive. And um, I think that I was more, a little bit more prone to explore things because everything was new to me. I didn't understand what was happening and I was away from my parents. I didn't have another voice in my life except culture right. and what they were saying. And, and I think that I'm, there was an opportunity where maybe if I had been able to learn more about culture and know more that I could have made better decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good segue then to our final question about how we talk to our kids about sex. Uh, this writer says, you spoke in your message about the dangers of bringing up your children in an overly sheltered manner, even if well-intentioned. What practical advice would you give parents on how to approach this topic with their children in more helpful ways? Yes, yeah, so I definitely think just the underlying denominator is to be able to talk to your children and to start talking from an early age. Um, I can accredit your wife um, to uh, teaching in a Bible study that I was in where she talked about just talking about sex in a very practical mm -hmm. way. Um, I do think when we don't talk about it, but you hear about it at school yeah. or you hear about it somewhere else, then we're allowing culture, we're allowing other people to shape what our children think about sex. And so even though it feels awkward to talk to my seven-year-old about body parts with the real words, sure. yeah. um, which is one of the things she encouraged us to do, uh, it feels awkward and it feels uncomfortable for me, but I want them to know that mom is a place where we can talk about these things, that I don't have to go to the locker room or wherever to find out these things that everyone else seems to know right. and and yeah. not and not get the right story yeah. most of the time and i think it's so good from a young age to to lay out god's plan for sex you know i thought with the don't talk about it and don't do it that sex is a bad thing mm -hmm. it's a bad thing and when you're in rebellion do you want to do bad, bad things, things. Um, and so laying out God's plan that it is good and it is designed for a purpose in a marriage, in a relationship, and, and just from an early age, having that being the thought process around sex um, and keeping that open dialogue with your kids. Yeah, as Christians, we should be the last people to surrender this very, very important area to the world. To the world. Yeah, let's, mm -hmm. let's take that initiative. And we do. Because Good. it's uncomfortable to talk about. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thank you again for a great, thank great you. message. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time on Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.